Yo, I'm Michael from Beyond and Broken, and you're watching Richard Metal Fan. Hey, what's up, guys? Episode 215 of Richard Metal Fan Interviews, calling from Zoom again, and I'm here with Michael Money from Beyond Unbroken. How are you doing today, Michael? Uh, doing all right, yeah. Uh, kind of a little bit of a cold, to be honest. Like, my body's, like, feeling a little ugh today, but hopefully it just shrugs off. Hopefully it's nothing good. It's serious. <laughs> yeah, I heard it's, like, fl flu season or, or something. I had, like, a, a little, like, congestion a few weeks ago, but I'm all good now. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I just woke up like a little bit weirdly cold feeling. So I was like trying to get more blankets. And then I got like really hot, you know. And then I got in stand up and I was like, oh, my body I feel like achy and stuff. I'm like, oh, crap. Hope I'm not getting sick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's all good. So uh, kind of like the format is I want to do like a rundown of your discography and talk about about your musical history. So to get back to young Michael Money. So kind of growing up, what were the first bands that got you into metal? What made you want to start playing guitar? Uh, really? Um, I would say it's a lot of things, but uh, definitely the influence ended up being like the new metal era. And all that, like, the, you know, the bands like Korn, I mean, there's like Static X, Seven Dust, you know, Rob Zombie, all that fun stuff was like a definitely a huge impact on my life as a kid. Like, I used to, like, get the Guitar World magazine, cut out the pictures of the guitarists and hang them up on my wall for, like, inspiration and stuff, you know? Like, I did all that as a little kid. <laughs> and uh, yeah. pretty much, like, my mother, she wanted to play guitar. Uh, she came home with an acoustic, um, and then uh, for some reason she just, you know, life happens or whatever, but she never got around to it. But me and my brother just loved it, and we picked it up right away, and we tried to imitate our favorite artists and stuff like that. You know, being like at that age, you know, you're a little kid. I think like the very first song or songs I learned was like Sweet Dreams by freaking the Marilyn Manson one. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know how to play it. <laughs> yeah. Stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. And yeah. When you get when you get older, like in school, I hung out with all the, like I had a little posse of friends. We all were, were studying guitar, you know, in school, like in middle school or something. And I was like, I was like the first kid to learn, to learn crazy train in my class. So everyone thought I was like the absolute coolest kid to be around because I knew how to play crazy train. I was like, yeah, dude, you can't play this I'm too good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's but, cool. Yeah cool because I've, I've had your brother on a few weeks ago and he pre pretty much said the same thing like new metal was like the the first metal you he heard heard and it's cool so so i'm guessing it's like you and your brother kind of like have like the similar thing like you both grew up with like the same kind of music yeah well we had bunk beds so we had the same room so we were always talking about music you know in our in our bedroom when we go to bed or wake up or whatever so we were constantly like influencing each other in that sense too as well like when we're just kids, man, just kids wanting to play music, you know, that whole era. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I remember like the first like new bands I've heard that got me into metal was I remember hearing like the first Corn album. Like I remember hearing like that that oh. riff to Blind, which of course a lot of people say like Corn is like the first band that pretty much pioneered like the whole new metal genre. Same thing with like a lot of people say like like Black Sabbath. Sabbath, like the first time you heard the the first riff to the song Black Sabbath from Black Sa Sabbath, it's kind of similar to how how like they invented heavy metal. Oh, it's kind yeah. of similar to how like like when you hear the riff to Blind, Blind is pretty much how like Corn pretty much I guess oh, yeah. started like, new it's metal. Iconic uh, at that age, you know, riffs are like what captured everything, and I was like, I want to be a riff god, <laughs> you yeah, know, just like these guys. You know what's funny? A fun fact I just learned. If you yeah. go and check Spotify on that song Blind by Corn, Ryan Shuck uh, from Orgy and Julian K was also a co-writer on that song. Oh, wow. And I had no freaking clue, but it was just mentioned to me by my label the other day because uh, one of my friends, he's on the label too, and uh, he's working with Ryan, and he told us that story, and I was like, no shit. <laughs> I was like, I got to go check this out, man. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, guy from the guitars from orgy at that time and Jordan that's a band name i haven't heard Over. in a minute i know right so the, that was like that was like a throwback for me yeah he's definitely he's his name's called the annex um he definitely has like a futuristic type of sound and stuff like that so julian k and all of them are like in that realm like and um yeah but it's cool i think he's also 
became the singer of Dima. They're trying doing stuff again too. Yeah, I was like, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I know isn't like the singer from that band like like related to Jonathan Davis from Corn. Oh. oh, yeah. Oh, I think it was his cousin, and um, something like that. And I heard um a bad thing about how he got like addicted to drugs and stuff, and like kind of fell out of it and stuff and like they don't talk and stuff like um yeah so it's kind of sad a little bit <laughs> yeah and apparently there's like a new metal kind of like revival now now because i remember because was i remember had interviewed a dino from fear factory because i know there was like the first waves of like of like new metal was like corn i guess deftones limp biscuit system up and down and slipknot and then there was like that second wave when new metal was at its peak with like disturbed papa roach and lincoln park park and then now we have i guess like newer band Bands. I guess there was like the band issues that pretty much like start was like part of that whole like I guess new metal revival well now so it's crazy to see like how it's like coming back to like in full circle yeah I think with a, a lot of things bands from where like the like I would say like the transition to the emo thing started happening and then when kids started to grow up or whatever you know and then there's that whole like it's never a phase and stuff like that but then there's this whole diversity where like a lot of the ones who still have great careers, like learn to kind of adapt from the emo-ness, but adapt it to like a modern touch today. And I think bands like Bring the Horizon did a good job at that. Um, they definitely have a good diverse sound from when they first put out like Chelsea Smile, you know, and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot of bands who, are, who get it and like are making that change for sure. Because I, I think it's like your identity for sure you don't want to change, but if you can learn to manipulate like uh, what's ever trending in modern music today and stuff like that and put your own stamp on it, I think all, all hooray to you, you know? Totally. And of course, a lot of people know you from Beyond the Broken, of course, obviously, formerly of Escape the Fate. Fate. Wait, what were your bands like even before that? Because I know I had Chase on. I think you you, you two were like in a band before Beyond Unbroken or even long before Escape Oh, yeah. Fate. Yeah, Chase. Uh, Chase was the very first drummer I ever jammed with. He was like the guy I found in the Craigslist ad uh, with my, my buddy DJ. He passed away. God bless his heart. And um, we, uh, we, yeah, because we put an ad in for a drummer on Craigslist and then, uh, but we eventually just found his, his ad, you know, stuff like that. And uh, our band was called Forgive to Regret. We uh, recorded like three songs, which I actually have. It's hilarious. And that, that was how we got kind of reconnected was because I wanted to hear them. And I completely forgot I did them in uh, Chase's dad recorded our songs for us because he, he's kind of like he knows a little bit about recording and stuff so we went with his dad and he recorded our band it was it was great and uh it was great hearing the songs again after like so many years it, it was touching to my heart to like reconnect with chase in that way and be just be like we never left each other just pick right on up and stuff it was really touching to me and i love it i love him great dude awesome dude yeah and did like like you and chase's like old band ever did like shows with escape the fate back in the day no we didn't actually <laughs> but uh we were very close there was a lot of uh local bands during around that time but we we did play one show and got paid for it too as well which is pretty rare and I, we had a manager at the time and he was like i think he was just like the popular kid in school or something and was just like, let me manage you guys and let's go play at like frat parties and stuff and like around Vegas. And so that's what we did. We played like a few parties in like people's garages, you know, that whole kind of vibe. And then we actually had a show and it was in uh, Provo, Utah. And we all crammed in like our singer's little tiny car. And like, man, I remember like it was yesterday. It was horrible drive up there. <laughs> and, uh, but we played it, we killed it, and like uh we got paid for it and we all crashed at like the other band's parents' house or something. And um and uh one of the other bands, he like his dad owned like a uh, a little Caesars. So he was all cool and he opened it for us like at one in the morning and we all were making like our own pizzas at Little Caesars and stuff. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It was it was like quite a fun trip i'd say 
uh, with a show on top of it. But yeah, we played that show. It was really fun. And then we we set up a, a show in our basis's backyard. Uh, and we had like just friends come over and stuff. And we even built like a mini stage or something. And we had a, we had Escape the Fate come over and they watched us play. It was really, it was just like a fun time. Like it was all the guys from Escape watching us play and they're all like, yeah, not not too bad, you know, <laughs> doing that whole thing when you're kids and like judging other bands and being like, my band's better than your band, that whole rivalry. But I didn't look at stuff like that. I was just like, oh, it was my brother and my other friends and stuff like that, you know. So yeah. it was quite a fun time and, and it was really interesting to just play like that and just like, you know, do that whole thing as a kid, local band stuff. is it It's fun. It's what made me though, for sure. Cool. And so how did you end up joining Escape the Fate the Fate? Did you like your brother hit you up be like, hey, do you want to come be in the band? It was yeah, it was sort of like that. Um, I definitely know that the other guitarist, Omar, was there. And um how it worked was I I was working for um, I was I worked at UPS and Coca-Cola for a little bit when around that like age of 16 or 17, whatever it was. And um, they, my brother asked me to be a tech on the tour. Um, they asked if I wanted to come out and try and tech for them and do that whole thing and learn the side of the music and pretty much that whole side. Like I didn't even have a cell phone. They bought me a cell phone. Uh, I met, I was already buddies, you know, back in Vegas with everybody. But when I got there, it was definitely like, oh, Michael. And then Ronnie gave me his bunk bed and stuff like that he's you can have my bunk bed bro and i was like yeah okay are you sure that's cool he's like yeah i'm gonna sleep in the front lounge so i remember them being like tremendously nice about my presence being there and i met the manager the same day um and they were ronnie was having a huge fight on the bus with the manager and was like you're stealing money from us. You're stealing money from us, bro. I know it. I know it. And that, that was like my first, very first time ever meeting the manager. And that's how it went down. <laughs> so oh, shit. After. Yeah. And that, that was how I met him though. I was like, oh, his, you know, I won't say his name or nothing, but uh, yeah, that's how we got, I got introduced to their manager like that. I was like, oh, okay. But I, I went out on that tour. I learned a lot of uh, the touring side of it, be, being a tech on the stage. And um, I also helped with like the merchandise eventually because the merch guy, uh, Bobby, who owns Blackcraft now, uh, he was he we were on the we were working the merch table together, and uh, he he got sick of the guys or something and he wanted to go home, so I took over the his part and then the tour manager on that tour uh, left too, so I was trying to like be acting kind of manager, merch guy, and tech guy. All on this Triple very duty. first tour, I've yeah, all of this very first tour I've ever been on. You know, I'm like trying to get everything down. I'm getting yelled at by the Warp Tour guys because it was Warp Tour, and I was getting yelled at by all the Warp Tour guys. Like, you're not doing this right. You're not doing. I was like, bro, I had two other guys quit, and I'm trying, and I just started. Like, I'm trying to learn everything, but I picked it up pretty fast. I'd say, um, you know, and stuff like that. That, but I had like the really shit job, like. When uh, the singer Ronnie threw up all over the the stage, I, they would make me have to go do the get like the whole thing and like wipe it down and clean it every time he puked on the damn stage because other people could trip on it, you yeah. know. And I'm I'm the only dude. <laughs> this is back in 2007. It was like when I wasn't in the band, but I was teching for the band. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it sucked, dude. And then like the guitar player was like a big sweaty guy, and um always like make his guitar disgusting and uh, gross and sweaty every time they played and i'd have to go in and clean it and it, i would get yelled at by him for like not cleaning it good enough i'm like well you're the one making a goddamn mess it's so like gross and like inside the pickup guards there's like sweat and spewage of drool and stuff i'm like damn dude what the <laughs> yeah, yeah. So i was like do my best to try and clean that up but eventually I met uh, our other guitar tech who who eventually came. Our friend was uh, Evan. He worked for Ernie Ball and they had a guitar tech guy at the Warp Tour. We'd always give him the guitars too and I'd give make him clean the sweaty mess of all that. <laughs> but he ended up becoming the official guitar tech for Escape the Fate for like the longest time. 
Yeah. And so yeah. tell me about like the first tour that you did as the, the guitarist for the band, because I know you just so, played live from like yeah. 20, 2007 to 2012 and then became official. So tell me about like the first so time playing live with it, them. How it happened was um, pretty much I was living with my uncle in, um, what's it called? Uh, Carpen Maria near Santa Barbara. I was like, uh, just like living there and like, I was like rummaging around because my stepdad was like an a-hole, you know, and like it was like a weird whole dynamic of that. And I didn't want to go back and live with my stepdad. So I moved in with my uncle and I was staying down there for a few months. And my brother, um, he pretty much was like, um, he hit me up and he was just like, hey, we, we're trying out guitarists, but I, I could tell he wanted me there, you know? And, um, but we, we want you to come and try out and like, if you're going to do this, I'm not going to be easy on you because you're my brother or nothing. I'm going to be hella hard on you. And if you want this, you got to show me you want this, like, and you want an opportunity to do music for real and stuff. And I was like, uh, you know, uh, let's, it was like a, a decision I had to, you know, definitely think about. And I had to like quit everything that I was doing down there and like come back to Vegas and just like work my ass off and study everything, uh, be literally becoming just a, a more professional guitarist at that time, like learning and the album and stuff like that. Cause they were just about to drop, uh, this war is ours. And, um, the, I went in the studio a few times in between there and try to help Brian write a few riffs and stuff like that. And definitely John Feldman was like, uh, let's go. We don't got time for this. And like, cause we were trying to do a solo or something on this war is ours. And he was definitely like, we don't got time for this. We got, we got to go. He's like that kind of guy, but it was cool though. Alan turned out great. Um, yeah, but they were just wanting the, this guitarist. And, uh, so I worked really hard at it and I tried out and we played in my house. The band came over to my house and we set up and like, it was definitely nerve wracking on me. Cause the man, the manager's there and like, I played all the songs did everything, you know, as much as I could even rocked out, you know, did my thing or whatever at that age. And like, they were all just like, they gave me the nod, you know, that kind of the nod, like, they're all kind of like, do you agree? Do you, agree? you know? And then the manager, after it was all done, no one said anything to me. And the manager was like, how much money do you want a week? Like, how much do you want? And I was like, oh, shit, did I get it? Like, I didn't know. I was like, cool. And then uh, and then he, he definitely lowballed me because <laughs> I was, like, just a kid, you know, and I wanted to do music. I got paid, like, it was, like, pretty not great. I, you know, it was, like, I think it was, like, $400 a week or something like that, something like that. And then I got paid, like, an extra $50 a day for per diem, and I had to hang up all the posters for every show uh, to get the extra 50 or something like that. And so when I got in there too, they were like, okay, we want you in the band, but we don't like want you in the band, like the face on it. And yeah, so I, I was just a kid and I just wanted to play music. It beat what I was doing. So I was just like grateful for the opportunity at the time, but they, they definitely uh, took advantage of that for sure of my like gesture and my niceness and they just wanted my skill set. And, uh, you know, my brother had my back in that, like half the band, I don't want to attack anyone, but like half the band was like, no, we should have them in the face of the band. Cause this was like right when they're about to announce Craig in the band. And, um, they're, they're like, should we announce him too at the same time? Or should we keep it for? And they're like, uh, definitely some of the guys were like, uh, Max and Robert were definitely like, no, we, we want to keep him behind. And the manager didn't want me to be in there too, because really I found out later on, Hey, they just didn't want to pay me like more money and have to split more with me really is what it was. So they just wanted to use me and pay me out like a hired gun pretty much. But I was all for, it. I was just like acceptable just to be playing music and stuff like that at the time, but definitely Craig and my brother had my back and was like, you, he should be in there. Blah, blah, blah. This is weird. But yeah, I did it, you know, and uh yeah it was definitely difficult to play the music and like be off stage sometimes yeah the the, wor the worst one was when i played in san francisco and i had like my own pa out in the hallway 
and I, I, I was nowhere near the stage. I was out in a hallway and I had a little PA and I had to play along to the, to the music with the, the PA. <laughs> and, uh, but I did it in a, you know, I did like all the weird stuff like that. I can't even see the band and just playing and stuff like that. Or they would try to hide me behind like certain stages or when they did hide me, it wasn't well enough, you know, and people could clearly see there's another person playing and stuff like that. And like when there's like the rooftop kind where the audience is above too, they could see the whole back of the stage and see that there's another dude playing. And then they're always like, who's that guy? Who's yeah. That? <laughs> I remember yeah. there was like a video yeah. online of like you, 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 Brian and I forget Patrick were like talking about it. Yeah, um, there was a video which um, we put out after we left Escape talking all about that. And it was, it, it did so well that it was demoralizing um, Escape the Fate's reputation. Um, so their lawyer had us take it down. It's, he sent us a legal notice and said that we we're, we're going to stop the royalties if uh, you don't take it down. So we had yeah. to take it down, but... Actually, someone re-uploaded it. Yeah, I saw, again. and that's how I saw. I found <laughs> out about that. I was like, "Damn, yeah. I had no idea but, that happened." But yeah, that video was blowing up. People were like, "Oh my god!" And we definitely had a fuel behind what we were doing with us and like branching off, and you know. Uh, but I, I didn't want to attack anyone. But they, they definitely took advantage of the whole situation and stuff. Like even on Warp Tour, they they made fun of me and was like taping out a little box and making me stay in the little box on the stage and stuff like that. That's when it, all that stuff really started to get to me. And um, what really sucked about all that um, was when uh, the band got their deal with Interscope Records for Major. And um, they're like, okay, it's crunch time. We got to work on the next album, you know, and all that. And they wanted me there. And um, so I got paid like 40 bucks a day to be there. And um, I worked in it. No one was there. It was just me and my brother. And uh, Robert was only there for like a few days to lay down some of the drum parts. Then he went home back to Vegas. And um, the bassist was never there. He was off. He was a drug addict. And he never showed up to the studio. Not once ever. And Cra Craig had a, had a room at our apartment complex place. But there was nothing really for him to do because he just, he didn't know how to play instruments or nothing. He just sang. So it was up to me and my brother and our engineer at the time to get the record done. Um, we, we paid a producer, a, a hefty, like, uh, I want to say almost like a half million, uh, to, to do, help us do the record. But he was just like more of a glorified engineer at the time. So it was definitely on us. And it was, you know, it was a, it was a hectic process to get done, but, I think we got it, you know, me and my brother. And, uh, you know, it was definitely interesting to do. And um, what really affected me was like um, when um, that album was all wrapped up, you know, I still wasn't official or nothing, but I, I literally just helped them wrote their whole entire album. It went, didn't even show up to the studio. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So that was a little daunting. And uh, what hit me a lot was when, I saw we we're in Australia touring and that album like just dropped and uh, we we're on Australia and Max showed me his bank account and it was like negative $12 and then pending $390,000 in his bank account. So everyone got paid out from the Interscope deal. Like they got their, uh, the merch deal it was like a million. And then they got the signing deal too on top of that. And um, that's what they used like half of that to help fund the record. And the other half went to the band. So that's why it came out to that amount. So everyone got paid out, you know, for do doing the work, you know, but I, I didn't get a penny from any of that. And that really hurt me because I, I wrote those songs with my brother and like I, I felt the impact of that. And so what I did was I was like, I'm taking the publishing side and I'm taking the songwriting credits uh for that album then and there was a big old fight about it and stuff like that and um because I, I did the work and uh max never was there uh drummer went home after just a few days and craig was there and he got his piece though and uh what, what he did we we he gave him the piece and me and my brother split the rest but we we caved in and um because we felt bad for max because he was crying about it and stuff and we ended up uh, 
giving them five percent uh and then uh i think we give the drummer also five or something like that just to help help make them feel they're a part of it and when they took that they're like if you if you let this if you gave us this uh you know i'll mad respect you guys because we weren't going to give them anything because they, ne they never showed up they never did the work so uh we ended up caving in and gave them a percent so they could have their name on it anyways though and um i you know because we felt bad for them and um yeah but there was definitely like a whole argument about that uh max crying profusely about not getting anything and they were like but he never showed up to any of the writing sessions we had for that album we were working with John Five, Shine Down, uh, a few other people on the side, and Max never showed to any of that stuff, and so that that's why we were so adamant about you never showed up, so we're not going to give you anything. Like, what, what the hell, you know? Yeah, you know, you got to get, you got to put in the work, and you get paid for the work. Exactly. So we we got hated for that though, uh, eventually, and I think, uh, but at the time they were like, okay, we're cool with it, yeah, okay, but I think they threw it in my face later about all that but that during that time was when right after that i saw max get a check for that um, 300 something plus thousand dollars so i'm like why are you bitching about five percent you just got this amount of money <laughs> it was like yeah, i didn't get anything. about that i didn't get nothing man and like uh i just got i was just focused like hopefully maybe the song does well you know that and then i would get like a royalty statement and stuff like that but my my stuff was nowhere near like that. So Max got way more money than he ever deserved. The drummer and then uh, Brian and uh, Craig got what they deserved, but I got cut out of it. And so it drove me like insane. And it made me like uh, uh, depressed and stuff like that. And that's when I was drinking a lot. And uh, eventually I quit. I quit the band right at the hiatus. Uh, we were in New York City and I was just drinking every night. And uh, Max was supposed to come out and we're supposed to tour in the UK with Bullet for My Valentine and we couldn't find him. He never showed up. So we're all in New York City just hanging out and we and then we're supposed to be on tour with Bullet for My Valentine in the UK. But Max, we even hired like a, a professional like drug counselor for him to watch wherever he went and stuff like that. Like that's how much we cared about him. So we, we had that guy watch over him when we couldn't, and he's supposed to watch where he goes and make sure he's not up to mischief. But eventually he, he got away somehow. We couldn't find him. And so we had to cancel the bullet for my Valentine tour, um, during that it was 2010. And, uh, we were just in New York city for like two weeks hanging out. And that's when I went on a drinking binge and I almost like died. <laughs> I went oh, back shit. home to Vegas. I went back home to Vegas and I was like really sick and I didn't know why I was sick, but I was just over drinking a lot. And, uh, eventually it led to me being in the hospital on my birthday and I, I j just drank too much, you know, and I almost would wreck myself. So I quit the band right there. And that was, that was the very first time. It was a tough decision for me. I didn't want to do that, but I, I would just like, they didn't want me officially in it again. And. Oh yeah, they, they what they said was the manager came to me. He goes, after all that stuff, the big deals were done. He came to me and was like, "How does a thousand bucks a week sound to you?" <laughs> and then the, I was seeing all these guys getting like a hundred plus six, seven figure, not seven, but six figure cuts and deals. And then they're just like, "How's a thousand bucks sound a week for you after all that? We just made all this tons of money and stuff." <laughs> And I was like, sounds like shit, I'm done, I quit. And then that's when I was done the first time. And I, I left the band 2010. Brother was still in there. And uh, they ended up getting uh, Kevin Thrasher eventually. Um, he joined in, uh, filled in my spot. But Brian was there too for like, I want to say like another year. And eventually um, we decided to move to California because we're we were living like, pretty horribly in a tiny apartment for like the longest time in Vegas before we, we bought our house in California because of the, the main, the Interscope deal and stuff like that. Um, so we got, we got this house, we moved out to California and me and my brother were, uh, when he get home between tours, he just be like, I don't want to go back out. And he ended up quitting, um, because he, I, I think my, probably cause I wasn't there to help support him or something, but it definitely got to him emotionally. Um, 
and so he quit and stayed home and we we just started writing um back in like i want to say like the end of 2011 for like six months we would just write uh here at our house and acoustics and stuff and we just like demo things out on our like whatever our laptop and stuff we had at the time and then uh later on i want to say 2012 like the beginning uh robert called us and was like hey we're playing in san diego avenge sevenfold do you guys want to come and like just hang out and whatever and robert is like one of our close homies you know so i was like yeah we can come out and like see what's up with you guys and stuff and then so we went to the show and it was definitely weird because they they had a signing and we were just hanging out with them because we had nothing to do and me and my brother just we went to the merch table and all the fans were coming up to me and my brother and wanting us to sign stuff but and then like kevin thrasher would sign like on the thing too it was really funny so we all had to chuckle about that it was really funny because everyone's like Ugh. <laughs> And uh, what was really goofy about it was like getting to watch Escape the Fate from the front of house uh, perspective. So we went and watched Escape, our band, play on the in the amphitheater. And we were in the front of house and we we're just like, yeah. And we we're watching the songs, you know, where me and my brother are bickering about like how it's actually supposed to be played. And like the, what parts that the guitarist messed up or try to learn differently and we're just like, yeah, that doesn't sound right. That's not it. That's not the part. <laughs> you know, you do all that. It was really funny. But uh, yeah. it was good for them, you know, and stuff like that. But um, it would all ended well, though. It all ended well, and we I wish the guys luck. And, uh, like, I want to say, like, a, literally a week later, Robert calls me and Brian, my brother Monty. Uh, you know, you guys refer to him as Monty, but we or my family, we talk, we call him Brian, his, his middle name. But uh, he calls us up, and... He was like, yo, Escape the Fate's done, man. Um, I don't know if we can keep going on. Just Kevin doesn't have it, you know. He doesn't have that that skill set like you guys do. And I think it's done. But we got together and we had been talking with Craig and the and uh, I think it was TJ they had at the time. And I didn't really know TJ at all. And they're like, we're, we, we're wondering if you guys want to come back and you know and try to make this actually happen and do another record and you know and stuff like that and we we felt bad because we we could hear like robert crying in his voice you know about it and there was like a heartfelt moment at that time where we're like you know what let's let's do this let's 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 make it happen but i gave him the stipulation i was like okay if i'm coming back and doing this robert you're making me full-fledged member and we're getting rid of our that manager <laughs> because I hated the manager. And uh, what was good was when uh, he they told him I was going to be official, he quit. The manager quit. He was like, I don't want to deal with that guy because I never got along with the manager because I saw through all his weird ways that he would manipulate the band and stuff like that over the years. And he didn't want to deal with me because I wasn't man manipulatable or whatever to like all of his bullshit. So... He didn't like me. He ended up quitting as soon as he found out I was going to be official. And I was like, hallelujah, let's go. Let's find a, a new manager and let's do the official way. And uh, we went in and um, the music that me and my brother were writing at home ended up being the Ungrateful Record pretty much though. And, this uh, one right here. Yeah, that's it right there. Yep, yeah, there's a, that's I, my signature. Yeah, yeah, I actually got this on yeah. e from eBay, and it, it came signed by everybody that was on the album at the time. That's awesome. You have that. That's really cool. Yeah, it's like touching. I love this. Like nobody ever talks about this album, dude. It, that album is literally like the the definition of me and stuff like that. And because me and my brother wrote it at home, and before even Escape, we were out of Escape the Fate. We were like thinking about doing something else. That was when we were thinking about doing Money Brothers or something. And so more than half of all those songs were already written and stuff like that. And when we went yeah. back, we just took those songs and uh, we had a such a fun time recording it. Uh, no, no, by fun time, I mean miserable time. But uh, we went to Feldman for three of them. Um, and uh, he was awesome. He's an amazing songwriter. Feldman brought in um, Boys Like Girls singer. Um, and he, he came in there super cocky and he was like, I don't write no B sides, bro. I only write hits, man. And he, and he, he wrote the hook line for one for the money. Yeah. That was it's a great song. I was, 
yeah, he wrote the hook line. And, uh, you know, I thought it was kind of cheesy, but I kind of loved it because his energy. And Craig was definitely stumped. And he had, like, writer's block during that whole album. And so he we needed help a lot for that album to happen. Like, I had Brandon from Atreyu come over our house, this house, and he went and recorded. We had a, mi a microphone in our bathroom, and uh, <laughs> and we, he, uh, he, he took uh, Ungrateful and You're Insane, and he busted those out, like, in five minutes, like, I was like super impressed. Damn. Yeah, I was super impressed. He just got in there, literally one fucking take. Brandon did the whole ungrateful idea. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I love it. And Craig was having such a hard time. Like, I, I think I have the old demos of what he was trying to do and stuff like that. And it was just like something was just not right. So I'm I'm definitely glad we got in uh Brandon, who knew a lot about vocals and stuff like that to really uh write the song out for the lyrically uh to make it come together and uh he did you're insane too right after that it was amazing and then uh and we had a uh, even like a another guy julian from, uh, they had like a hit song on blue mountain state show from netflix and uh he wrote like the whole tagline for fired up um and i love fired up it's one of my favorite songs to ever play live um and that album is great. And then we we even had like a another guy who who like works on Britney Spears stuff and like some rap stuff. He came in and did a Desire, which was a really fun adventure. So we had like all these guests, like vocal people come in. And the other one we had was uh, Patrick um, from Fall Out Boy, who ended up writing um, Picture Perfect. He came up with the whole thing and the idea behind it. And he sat us down and was like, what do you want this song to be about? And stuff like that. And he just went in and started making melodies. And I have the take of it with his voice on my computer. And it sounds amazing still to this day. And almost like, like, bro, you should have just sang that song. Like, it was that good. <laughs> it's like, he's just a skilled vocalist. And it, he writes beautiful melodies. But yeah, he, we definitely had a lot of help write, writing like that. And... We we went from uh, John Feldman, then to David Bendith, who tried to like be our counselor or something, and that didn't work out, and so we trashed what he was doing. Went back, and then ultimately, me and my brother were like, "Let's just get a spot, and let's we know what we want to do." So we got an engineer, and we went to NRG Studios in North Hollywood, and that that's where like a lot of famous records were um, made, like Lincoln Park Records. A few of them were made there. And so we went there and um, our manager at the time got us like a huge discount and we went in there and we, we nailed like the back half of um, Ungrateful album, like uh, Ungrateful the song was recorded there with just me and my brother and an engineer uh, that we got and it was just, uh, it took off, but we did each one like that and we had like Brandon, Brandon from Atreyu kind of come in and help, help with Craig do his vocals properly to to make it like um it you know do become well on the the song so he put it he got his name as like a co-produce on that album if you look on the back i think on it uh, yeah brandon soller yeah. yeah yeah i know he, he did like that. five of the songs ungrateful until we die you're insane chemical love and fire it up yeah he was he was helping out craig because craig i don't know what was going on with him but he was definitely having uh a tough time with writer's block and stuff and uh just wasn't it just wasn't happening and so we had to we had to get people to kind of help him out and that's how that's how the album got put together but yeah. when that album got all done and wrapped up which was really funny we were like who's gonna mix it and like the the guy who owns nrg wanted to mix it for free and uh but my brother absolutely hated the mix <laughs> and like i was more like i was more just like pressured by it because this guy he's done like of mixes for like seven dust static x freaking all the classic new metal stuff and like so i forget his name what it was but if you look at nrg hills name will pop up the owner but uh uh so my brother joshua hated wilbur it yeah josh wilbur is who we went to we ended up going to yeah but uh there was another guy who we tried to mix it and it wasn't it wasn't right and my brother actually i thought it was okay but my brother was like hell no 
I'm not putting this out. He goes, we got it. We got to get more help. We got to go back. And we, that's when we found uh, Josh Wilbur and like he did the Gojira. He did Lincoln limb biscuit and he lived over in long beach. And we went over his house with me and my brother, we just drive over to his house every day and we like fix the songs and stuff like that. He even put in like screams, like his own screams uh like and fired up there's like a background one and stuff that he instilled in there that's his voice and like he, we just went through every song and we made it better and stuff like that so he was more like of a producer type of guy on it even though he's he, he mixed it but he definitely we he made that record sound punchy and stuff so i, I give josh wilbur fucking thumbs up and all that yeah he, yeah. he definitely made it uh glue together yeah, and hard to believe that this year does mark the 10-year anniversary of this album. But um, do you have like a different feeling about this album now as opposed to when you first released it? I love that album. It's like, uh, it was my definition of me and everything that I do and coming out on it. Like, uh, yeah, I, if I touch with that album today is my heart for sure and stuff like that's me in there, you know, for sure. And so, and I love playing those songs even still to today when I joke around and stuff like that, like a fired up and all that. Like I used to wear a cowboy hat on stage and like, I would play with my mouth, pretend to play with my mouth, the solo parts and stuff like that. Or no, that was, uh, I played with my mouth on a, what was it? That freaking, uh, it starts with the lead. I forget yeah. what the song is called, but uh, that one was uh, we kind of helped co-wrote that one with uh, what's it, the Bear Two singer Caleb? Yeah. yeah, Caleb helped wrote the vocals, and I can't remember the song name right now. I don't know what yeah. that's called, but uh, yeah, he definitely. So we had a we had to get people for kind of every part to make that album what it was, but uh, the vocally side because the music was all there. It's just we we struggled with the vocal side of the album for sure. Yeah, and then then you started touring around for a little bit, and how hard it was it for like you you and Brian to leave Escape the Fate? Oh man, like that, that's a whole bag of worms and stuff like that because um, it, it was really, if I want to be you know transparent about it, and it's just a bunch of egos, you know, it's just a bunch of people and their their egos getting to each other, like and thinking they deserve more than the other person and stuff like that. That was definitely weird. Um, there was like all these bullshit arguments that they're just like spouting in their heads. Like you don't let us do anything, blah, blah, blah. You never let us do it. I'm like, what are you talking about? You were there. And then you went home again, you know, <laughs> like Robert did repeated the same thing he did. He didn't want to be there. And so he went home, you know, after the drums were done or whatever, he didn't want to like hang out with us anymore. He just had this thing where he always wanted to be home. And, uh, I think TJ, yeah, TJ was in there at the time and he was really new to everything. Like, and I just was learning who he was. And so I didn't, I didn't really know him or have anything in common with the guy. Like I, I still feel like I don't know him today. Uh, but it was definitely, um, like a, a weird dynamic, but it got, it got done, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you started up the, I guess, the first iteration of Beyond Unbroken being Bunny Brothers, and you, you did those two songs, Break Free and Clarity. So how did, like, the origin of the Money Brothers come to okay. be? Okay, so, yeah, like, it was a bunch of egos, you know, I want to say that. And, um, uh, but uh, it really came down to the tour we we're supposed to go on, and we we're going to go on tour with Five Finger Death Punch, and I was all for it. And, um... We're trying to figure out the transportation for it. And everything was kind of heated from like, I don't know, Craig not feeling like he was a part of the album, what really he was and stuff. I don't know. But we all had their back, but it was definitely like a feud going on, like just like of a mental thing. I don't really know. Uh, but it was definitely my my brother in the band arguing back and forth about the tour transportation. And uh, because we found like a deal for a bus and... Um, we, then we, that they wanted to go in the van and there's this whole big fight about the van and the bus. Like, cause we could afford the bus because the guy was giving us half off, but they're like, no, we need to save money and go in the van. But we're like, but the guy's giving us half off. So it's going to come out to the same amount. And they didn't believe us. They're like, no, you guys are lying and stuff like that. And then that, that just blew up that, that from there, that just blew up and everyone started arguing with each other. And I, I felt like I was in the middle of it all. And trying to be like babies calm down 
everybody chill out. <laughs> that was like definitely caught in the crossfire of it because I just want everyone to get along. But it was definitely like the other side versus my brother and arguing about the the bus and stuff like that. Because we got the discount, but the guys didn't believe us. They didn't they felt like we didn't know what we were doing and stuff. But we had the discount, but they didn't believe it. I don't know. So that that's what blew up in everyone's faces. And then it just led to a bunch of FU bombs and stuff like that. And there they called me. Robert called me and was like, yo, Mike, we're we're done with your brother. We don't want him to tour with us. Will you stay with us and keep the band going? And we're we're gonna get Kevin Thrasher back in. And you, you got to teach him all the parts, your brother's parts, and do all this, man. And uh, But we, we need you, Mike. And I, I thought about it for like a minute and uh, what my life would have been like if I did that. And I I respectfully said no. you know. And I was like, I don't ever see myself playing with another guitarist or making music without my brother. And the fact that they made me pick my family over my career was a weird thing for me. Yeah, and it's fucked up. That that sucked. Uh, because I I love my brother and I, I couldn't do that to him. So I had my brother's back a hundred percent because that, he's literally everything to me. Family is everything to me. And they're making me choose my family over my music career, pretty much. And so I was like, you know what? It ain't worth all that, you know, like doing all that. And so I love my brother. I'm going with my brother. I'm sorry, guys. And then they're like, well, F you too, Mike, blah, blah. You know, and they, I was like, what the hell? You know, it was like that. It was like, they're just like, well, F you too, man, blah, blah. It was, man, I was like, what the hell? Oh, my God. And then so, yeah, it just ended like all ugly, you know. Uh, but, yeah, that's how that went down, though, and like how that. But uh, we, um, we, uh, we didn't want to go extinct, you know, and stuff like that because right then and there, they without any warning they shut us completely off of all our social media outlets they've shut us off the facebook they changed the passwords they changed all of it and uh we were locked out so we had no voice to to talk to fans to explain what was going on about the the whole mess because then they they started doing interviews and they just started literally blaming us for everything that they think that happened that was bad with the band they were just playing the blame game and we we couldn't even talk because we didn't have a press outlet to talk about our side. So everyone just believed what the statements Escape the Fate said about us and stuff like that. And it was definitely like saddening to see that stuff. And like because it's not how it went down at all. It was just like a petty little argument, you know, that just blew up in everyone's faces. It really could have been resolved really fast, but everyone had just, you know, their egos are all going and like everyone thinks they deserve more than the other person. And I was just like, man, we're all friends. Why can't we get along? What the hell? And I was definitely caught in that crossfire. And then because I didn't agree with them, they tried to shove me under the bus too as well. But yeah, and so we we did the Money Brothers um, because we wanted to stay relevant. Um, and we ended up ma <laughs> making that video um, to, to kind of point out everything because they were, they were talking a lot of crap about us and trying to like dehumanize our reputation of everything we ever done in the music industry. And it was weird. And so that's why we made that the video at the time to like, to try and get like, that's not like how it really was. It was actually like, I, I had this whole thing I had to deal with, with my life, you know, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, we put out some music, you know, and then we kept the Money Brothers name because that, that's how everyone referred to us at the time. But we eventually uh, changed it to Beyond and Broken when, um, you know, we were trying to get more serious with it. And we're like, we need to have like an actual stamp on this and like, let's get serious and um, come up with a name. And we all, I wanna, we, we were like spouting names and we saw the, the this movie called Unbroken and that clicked with us. And it was about like everything that we were going through at the time of Escape the Fate and how they're trying to break us down and try to try to like waver us out like we never had anything to do with the music industry and all our records and stuff. and we pretty much are coming out on top. And so we're beyond all that. So you try to break us down, but we're, we're unbroken, something like that. Yeah. I forget that iteration, but that's how that, uh, the whole beyond and broken came about, about, cause yeah. it's really relatable about anyone who feels broken inside, but you, you move past it, you move beyond it and you grow more, you know, that's why people wear scars on themselves and 
but they still get up every day, you know, and they go and they do what they got to do to succeed in life. So that's yeah. what that whole thing means, though. Yeah, and then tell me about making that first CP, Don't Wake the Dead, which def def was definitely my introduction to Beyond a Brook. And I remember around 2020 during the pandemic, I was randomly discovering music. I was in a mood for, like, I guess the whole, like, warp tour kind of metal course up and escape the fate and then i remember of course discovering like like you were you're you're you and monty's band band i was like damn damn and monty's singing i'm like wow and then i think it was like the first song i heard was memories and i was like wow that's actually good and that's pretty much how i we discovered you guys and definitely became a fan since well that's awesome i'm glad that it was organic like that it just pro that just goes to show you that the songs speak for themselves then like uh you know let the music speak for itself you know but yeah, um, that that EP, we uh, went in the studio with Matt Good uh, from first to last. He, he got into producing. He produces like the Word Alive, Asking Alexandra, and stuff like that. And we wanted to keep our, like, I think we the kind of music we wanted to do was like we kind of wanted to do the Escape the Fate stuff, like to have that under our belt because that's our signature style. So we kind of wrote music like that, and uh, you know, and I was like learning more about myself as an artist too and like i'm not just a, a guitar player and that's when i got into like metal vocals and screaming during that whole era and like i i found out like after everything that i went through there um i probably wouldn't be as talented as i am now like knowing what i could achieve with if it wasn't for that breakup so i wouldn't have discovered like more talents like yeah. i would say about myself and like things i was willing to try things my brother was willing to try like when he stepped up and became a singer too and like his beautiful voice i love his voice yeah um, i yeah. was surprised hearing that i'm like holy <laughs> shit he can sing and then i remember hearing yeah. like the latest single i know i'm kind of jumping ahead when i heard you like do yeah. screams i was like holy shit lit my michael could scream i was like you sound fucking brutal yeah um i i love to do it it was really fun um i definitely you know i practice in the car to a lot of bands like in flames and you know all the all the, the bands like that who just have metal vocals and but it definitely in flames was one of my go-to ones <laughs> um <clears throat> yeah just practice practice you know and i eventually got that down and i wanted to utilize that skill set in uh the ep is where i first started to do it <clears throat> i did a few songs at home here I did Don't Wake the Dead here at home and um, did uh, Suffocate here at home. And um, yeah, those two I did at home. And then the one I actually, there's a few other ones, I think, but um, the ones I can remember, um, Under Your Skin was done at with Matt Good at the studio. And uh, we, we cheaped out on a hotel for the two weeks we were with him. And I got like insanely sick from the room or something. And I, I had like a throat problem i had to go to the hospital like the day before i had to do vocals and my throat had like a giant like weird yellow thing on the back of it oh, and shit. So i was i was freaking out and i because my throat felt like it was closing up and i'm supposed to record vocals the next day yeah the worst like, possible time yeah and i i am going to the hospital instead and so i went to the hospital they literally found out what it was it was just some you know a flu bug thing and they gave me uh, an IV and it went away like instantly. I was like, oh my God, I feel so much better. And they're just like, yeah, take these pills and make sure to eat and stuff and you'll be all right. So I went in and I literally have the hospital tag on my wrist still. And I went in and jumped right into the vocal booth. <laughs> and uh, I did I did the screams for Under Your Skin and like, and I was wondering how it was going to turn out. And I think I delivered pretty well for a guy who was just out of the hospital with uh with like a throat issue <laughs> yeah and uh i love it under your skin sounds freaking brutal um yeah it came out perfect though it was it was great you know and i achieved that and it was like a a, a sense of like yeah it did this come on you know it was yeah. a good a good feeling but yeah that was yeah. that <laughs> and then that of course your debut full-length album running out of time i thought that was a really great uh album. i feel like you guys really hit the ground running with that so tell me about like making that and of course that was released during like the whole like certain virus that shall not be named happening yeah. did that like at all like affect sort of like sonically like the sound and the direction of the album yeah um so we our engineer that was with us matt good he had an engineer named ryan and uh he eventually led led off and became his own producer because of like problems that were going on in their studio 
and uh, he went on to go become his own producer. So we're we're thinking about going back to Matt Good, but we're like you know trying to be budget friendly and stuff at the time too. So we ended up going with, with Ryan, which is like his right hand man, and if not, he did like made a lot of that stuff. Like where Matt Good sometimes took a back seat on, he would Ryan would be there like smart wizardry stuff, you know. <laughs> So we went to Ryan and uh he's freaking great. Um we we're we were writing the songs in there and uh we had like a even a guest vocal guy, a Johnny. Um he came in and did like harmonies on the a lot of the songs and it sounds beautiful. And we we wrote some out there type stuff cuz my brother was getting to the whole trap realm that was like popping off at the time, so they wanted to incorporate some of that into the some of the the songs like in my head and a few others like medicine and that eventually we led we came out later but um yeah so that was like a huge impact and i was kind of against all that i was like the metal guy i was like we need the riffs we need the shred you know i was definitely that guy but it was definitely cool to see this whole different side because ryan was really uh more of like an expert in that whole uh rap um trap world he, he knew about the beats and would come up with them on the fly and stuff like that so we we took a, like a different dynamic with it and uh we had a, a lot of fun writing that in a, a little studio um like a drummer next door who the walls were like not soundproof and we just hear him banging away the drummer next door while we're trying to do running out of time and stuff <laughs> so it was definitely like a funny dynamic but uh we would come out like every um we come out for like every two weeks at a time to work on the album with ryan he eventually moved into a better studio and was able to soundproof everything and that's where we did like the rest of the record and stuff like that and uh there was a lot of songs we did and some of them didn't make it and eventually we got around to putting them out later and stuff like medicine and with or without me those were the ones that we ended up putting out later but they didn't make the album because we wanted to do stuff to them later. Um, but we put out that album and I I first like a, I showed it to a few of my buddies that work at record labels. And um, because I was deciding whether to go um like self, like self-independent or use like a record label or not with that album. And um I was just like was learning about everything and like the whole music business side is where that journey kind of started for me in 2020. I When I, I was like, how are we going to release this? How are we going to do this and get it out everywhere? So I took that initiative to learn the whole business side of the music industry from the past three years now. And, uh, you know, and I can say there's a lot of, there's a lot to it. And it's definitely a, a bitch, you know, <laughs> there's the, it's, it's hard to do with one person, I'd say. Um, but we did it and um we dropped that record uh during like right when the pandemic really took off and like so that freaking sucked you know for us because it's a great album and uh there was like a lot of people were just getting hit everywhere you're getting hit with covid this covid that can't do nothing can't go anywhere can't play a show or anything like that so it definitely like sucked because we saw it growing but we couldn't really push it you know and so that that kind of sucked but so we, we, and we felt like the album wasn't like shreddy enough for us. And we saw all these people making a bunch of cover songs and cover musics of their favorite songs and stuff like that. That was like popping off. Everyone was making these quarantine videos, uh, just them co covering songs and playing music, you know? And we, we had an idea to come to not only cover a song, but combine like a mashup of two different songs. And um, that worked out, and that was, that was probably like one of the funnest things I ever done. Uh, that doing that because that that was like the the very first one where like we're doing this all on our own. We didn't go to anybody for that. We we're just we we're building up our home studio back then in 2020, and uh, we we're really putting money into it and trying to build it up, make it nicer so we can actually put out quality content. And it, it was amazing. It was super fun writing that song it definitely had our pop punk escape the fate stamp stuff that we do on it you know that we're famous for and stuff like that so we we implemented that into a, this trap song that wasn't really like that diversity like that and so that was super fun to 
to figure out and we combined it heathens in there for like the bridge which really worked out well and then when the song was kind of done and wrapped we i had an idea i was like brian uh or mothy you know <laughs> i was yeah. like we need to throw in the most epic solo ever <laughs> i was like this fits so perfectly if we did one and he he's like are you sure like i don't know man and i was like brian come on man you're like the 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 solo master we got it so i had to pump my brother up for it and uh we we got into it and we're like it needs to be like the guillotine if another guillotine came out and like a whole minute long thing and we'll, we'll duel it and do all this crazy stuff so we literally spent like an entire another month just on the solo <laughs> to make the solo fit into the song and stuff and i think that's like our breadwinner and everyone's like holy shit because uh, we ended up shooting like a at home video with our iPhone and my sister filmed us uh, with like an iPhone and like people love that when it comes to the solo part or doing the dueling solo, that's like iconic part like of our, and everyone's like, yes, see, that's the, that's the guys I know from escape the shred guy, you know, all that we're getting comments yeah. like that. And it, it felt good, you know, and we're like, yeah, it was cool. And that's what the album didn't really have. We didn't have songs that were like doing that kind of stuff. And that's what we're, popular for a guitar work and stuff like that um so yeah we did that approach with it and it was really awesome and that song ended up being our top song for like a, and i want to say like a number of years it, it just went into the millions immediately on spotify and uh, it like just organically just took off and everyone loved it and i'm i'm happy to put that out and i, I didn't know it'd blow up so much like that and it's amazing what that did for us you know like oh we could do this you know and stuff like that and everyone loves it and uh but yeah the other the other songs started falling along and i had ideas for um with or without me um i was doing my research you know like i do with the music side business side and i end up hitting up one of my buddies um who was he ended up being like a really big fan of us of our escape the face stuff his name was becco uh he's an artist named becco and um he does like the the whole um edm but like pop punk stuff mix and uh he definitely he, he uses that in his own music and stuff like that so i hit him up to uh do some production on with or without me and uh he loved it so much he loved the song so much he's like i never get anything like this across my table so thank you for letting me be a part of this and he he, he said like the nicest stuff like that and he was like i want to show this to my label and that was fixed ended up being fixed the the label we're on now but yeah he's like let me show it to them and i think they deserve to hear this and i was like are you sure like and, uh, and i had my doubts about everything but we ended up talking with them and stuff like that and uh we signed the song you know over to them and uh yeah and they loved it and they just took it and stuff and it was awesome like experience that and then uh we had a I had a, a remix done for running out of time with the, my friend, the annex, uh, who's also on the label too. And I didn't know he was on that label at the time until he like gave me like a, a contract thing to sign. And I was like, Oh, it's the label again. I was like, Oh yeah. Cause he did a, a remix for it. And I absolutely love the remix he did for it. We just did that to, to, you know, amp up the album and stuff. And it was really fun experience to do that. Uh, it was like, cause in Escape the Fate, we, we would kind of do throwbacks like that and let a few people remix songs to add like, you know, more dynamics to stuff like that, or just to release a deluxe version of an album and stuff like that. It was really cool as well. But yeah, uh, eventually I want to say when those were taking off, we ended up doing an acoustic version of Memories, which came out awesome. And yeah, it's we amazing. Were, yeah, we really, that's when we got into, uh, oh yeah, we did, we did Silver Spoon, that, which was amazing. That was a fun experience. We put that out and I had Ryan, um, who did the album, I had him come out here for like a few weeks and we were writing songs and stuff like that. But that was one of the ones we wrote over here when he was here. And, uh, yeah, so we ended up focusing our attention on that and we shot a really fun, crazy video like you could see in there, like I am like belligerent drunk towards the end of like the last part of the music video. Like I was just out of it. And that was like the first time I drank in like years. And like, I was just having such like a fun time, you know, shooting this video. It was really, it was a fun experience. You know, we're doing fun stuff. Like everyone's 
you know popping off and stuff but you're definitely like in that video at the end though you could just see me i was just like gone <laughs> but yeah i was like okay that never again never again i'm a grown up now i gotta be more mature and not not have like days like that <laughs> but i definitely got caught up in the moment that day yeah but it turned out into a great video i loved it and it's it's great it's awesome i had my buddy who who works for a lot of movie he does a lot of movie creature shop his name is vincent um he does a lot of creature work for movies and tv and music videos like he just did one for papa roach where he turned him into zombies and uh so i asked him to borrow werewolf heads and for like some of his actual movie props and stuff that are worth like a ton of money so that that was what we had in the the silver spoon video though those those uh werewolf heads it was really cool though and uh yeah uh, i want to say pretty much when the memories dropped the acoustic version of it and we were learning more the video side of it um we were learning more of the like how to because we wanted it to look a certain way we we invested a lot more into our video production side of the the, the whole look and we did our very first one with with or without me where we really got behind the camera and we that was all shot with me and my brother like i'm running down the street with a giant gimbal like attached to my whole body trying to get the skateboarder i don't know if you've seen that music video but like i was trying to get the skateboard shot this guy running going down the street and his uh mask and i'm like running behind him down the street trying to catch keep up with him and the guy didn't know how to uh, skateboard and stuff. So I was yelling at him and stuff. It was really funny. Yeah. But I, I think that video turned out uh, not too bad, uh, but we just got better with it over time, I think. And um, eventually um, we, um, I got approached by the label again, uh, Fix, and they were like, hey, we absolutely love running out of time the album. Could you let us re-release it and like let's work something out and like let's like sign you guys and stuff like that and so we had a bunch of conversations with them i had um like and i was like looking around because there was like a few labels in mine at the time um who wanted to pick us up so i was i was looking around you know trying to do my work and trying to make sure i'm making the right decision before i just up and do that but uh you know they what was really good was with them versus a lot of other labels was they were fully open to all my questions that I had about everything. They, they were like, and some of the other labels out there, they're like, no, that's proprietary information. We can't share that with you of how we do things like that. But that label was all open with me. And there, the guy was like, yeah, this is what, how we are. This is how we do our business. This is what we do. And he was, and that made me like, okay, I can trust these people. And they they got my best interests for us to to do everything. So they they absolutely loved the record. They loved the. I think the owner was like my favorite song is like medicine. <laughs> I think that's like one of my brother's least favorite songs, which is really funny. And but but our owner of the, our label was like that's like my favorite song. What are you talking? About? <laughs> it was really funny. But yeah um, yeah. So we ended up signing for a, a multi album deal with them which I was really excited about and, and also re-releasing the, and getting the respect and like the, the audience that um, running out of time deserves and stuff like that. And uh, you know, it was an amazing moment to like everything that I gone through and escape the fate. And then it be, felt like I was like thrown down to like coming back out again and like signing another multi-album deal like in like being now we're on tain and uh the uh they they picked up blood on my hands on the test drive yeah and so that was an amazing moment and i saw heard the jose megan the famous thing it was like jose megan yeah you on liquid metal me? yeah right. you're listening to me on i'm broken it, was it had to be an amazing tight. experience it was great i had to record it and a lot of our fans were uh, reposting it on our Instagram stories. So I was re retagging everybody and stuff like that. It was an amazing experience to have that because even in Escape the Fate, we never, ever had radio love. That was like the one thing we could never get. We never got the Octane. We never got all that. And for some reason, when we did this, we got it. And the very first song we did with our label, the very first one just got right on Octane. I was like, wow, that's freak. That's great. That's like a pat on the back for sure, I'd say. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So, uh, That's like one of my favorite songs for 2023. Of course, with the new lineup, with, of course, you, your brother, and of course, now having Ash and Ch Chase in the band. How did Ash and Chase join? Because I know you were you played with Chase years ago. Yeah, um, he, I was just, I think I was scrolling through old friends and stuff like that one day, you know, as you do, you, just, you rummage around through Instagram and stuff like that. And he crossed and I started thinking about like, like what his life was like and like where he's at because i knew he moved out to tennessee and uh he was back in vegas though and i was like oh he's back in vegas and like i hit him up to hear our old songs that we did and um he sent them over to me and then we just clicked from there and i was like hey would you be willing to send me like an audition video of you and um just drumming so to make to see what, what it's like if this will work or not and we also had a festival coming up and I was like, okay, we need, uh, probably a drummer, you know, and stuff like, that. because uh, we, in our music videos, if you, if you look, we have like a lot of different drummers, like, and they're all buddies of ours, you know? So I didn't want just like any typical drummer. I wanted somebody that I had like something with, you know? And so he was definitely like that other, that person that I wanted to reach out to. Um, yeah, we just clicked. We had a conversation. He sent me over. Actually, he sent me over him singing at first because he got confused because I was like asking if he can do any backup stuff. But I think he got confused. So he first sent me a video of him just singing in his car, which was really cool, though. <laughs> I was like, hey, at least I know you got that down, like you could do backing and stuff. But uh, then he sent me drums and stuff like that. Yeah, because if he, he tried to sing over like some backing stuff when he was playing his drum kit but it was so loud i couldn't even tell so it was good that he sent me that too like so i can depict like if he can do backups and stuff and like that <laughs> so it was good it was great and then uh he came down we kicked it off you know we jammed and it was great man it was awesome uh yeah it was, it was an amazing moment and it was like we never left and we talked about the old past and our childhood crazy ways and stuff like that and uh the festival is coming up so i was like should we get a bassist and i was like you know pondering in my head about it and i was like i i like the i think i like the look of it and stuff like that like i don't know if i want to do the blink 182 thing like have the three thing like um but if i was going to get a bassist i was like i don't want just like some another band sweaty dude who thinks they know everything you know because i feel like that's the most people i run into in the music industry they're, they're like they can be really full of themselves and think that like they deserve the world and step over everybody that's just like my take on that um i, I run into a lot of people like that um uh, where like chase was just more just like level-headed and was like hey what I, what do i gotta do guys you know they like willing to like learn and uh you know because he's all brand new to all this stuff and like he's just a drummer you know he didn't really know the whole other side that you can be if you really put your foot down you know and um eventually i put i made an ad um on bandmix is this website called bandmix i think and um i made an ad like looking for bassist uh and stuff like that but Eventually, um, I ended up like scrolling through it and I found this awesome picture of Ash and it, it definitely stood out amongst like the clutter of other people. Cause you know, they're on those things. There's like, sometimes there's like 50 year old dudes who just want to jam some jazz and stuff like that, you know, on those things. So I was definitely looking for like a, a young, more appeal. And I was like, I was like, I think that would be a really cool dynamic if we had a, a chick who can like just rip it on the bass and just like do backings and stuff like that. And then she turned out, I, I think I called her and I asked for an audition video for her and she sent me one and she could, she could, she was doing all the harmonies to losing my mind. And I was like, Holy shit, that sounds fucking cool, dude. Like yeah. she was doing all the harmonies. I didn't even ask her to, she just did it. And she was playing the bass and I was like, this is fucking awesome, man. She's great. And she looks freaking great. She's like, uh, a super cool down to earth person, tr truly uh, amazing person. Um, and uh, I got introduced to her, like eventually her whole family now, I know. And her whole family like roots and supports her. She has like a great support system with her family and they're all 
they support our band and everything like that. And I, I love them for that. And I think she was a, gr a great find and stuff like that. And she looks freaking great. And with the look that I was wanting to look for the band and stuff there for the time, you know, in that whole dynamic. Uh, yeah. And we eventually, um, we, we signed the deal, um, with fixed and we, we had a few songs in the pipeline and we had, um, I came up with a, a video concept idea for, um, blood on my hands and, uh, it just wa from watching videos and stuff like that. And I found the place where I want to do it and stuff like that. And we, that was one where we really like worked our, me and my brother worked our ass off on and the guys were just brand new and we're just trying to like uh, keep up, catch up. And so I really had to take like a, a, an approach how I wanted things to be done. Cause me and my brother had this certain, like, you know, this brush bar that we like to keep our quality on. And, uh, so they're, they're getting and trying to understand that. And so I was like yelling at chase. I was yelling at Ash. I was like, you got to fucking rock. Out. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I was like, but on all good spirits though, I was like, I'm going to go first and how I do it. I want you guys to all mimic me, but in your own way. And so I went first and I did my scenes first. My brother was filming it and I was like, and I, I loved it. And it turned out, I was like, so you got, I want you guys to watch everything I do and implement that in your own way. However you do, you know, be yourself, but just don't be still, you know, because I'm yeah. like, it's a music video. You <laughs> know, And so they did that. Uh, and I think they did a great job, but I was definitely like yelling at them the whole time behind the camera. Like, I need you to big arms. I need you to, you know, I was doing that whole thing. Uh, it's like, yeah, kind big of like arms, the director. Yeah. Yeah. Director approach. But I was like more emotion and, like, and stuff like that. And I, I thought they did a great job and I love them for that. And yeah, because me and brother are so used to this. Um, you know, when I first did my first music video and escaped fate, it was uh, uh, ungrateful where I was like, okay, I'm in, you know, and no one taught me anything like that. Like how, you know, how to be like a certain way of how you um, do a music video. Like, are we playing for real or are we like all just faking it, you know? And like, I was definitely, when I was rocking out, I was trying to play for real and I wasn't really like, uh, and, but I was trying to rock out, but I was mostly just trying to play for real. So no one would be like, call bullshit on me. Like, he's not playing the right thing. You know, he's faking it. You know, I thought that in my head, but, and then I looked at my brother's shots in the music video and he wasn't even playing the damn guitar. He like, has it like up above his head. He's like doing all these spit moves. Like he's freaking in Mortal Kombat. And it looked so much fucking cooler. And I was like, oh shit. So, okay, we're doing like this. And I was like, so I didn't understand that. So I had to learn that myself like how I want to be presented in music videos. So I was like, can we, can we shoot my scene again? Can we shoot mine? You know, and then we went back and shot mine and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. I get it now. But I, that was definitely like something that nobody teaches you. Yeah. Unless you, you know, things that you pick up as being a, a professional musician along the way and how you uh, make your appearance and stuff. But I was trying to, I'm trying to like instill those things in Ash and Chase and stuff like that. So I think they definitely look to me for stuff like that. And I'm here to help them out, you know, and however I can, you know, uh, but they definitely have that down. Uh, I think they did a great job with the video. <laughs> yeah. And I love the song too. It's a bit darker compared to like, don't wake your dead or running out of time. Yeah, it is. It definitely has that darker uh, dynamic element to it. Definitely influences like uh spirit box and bad omens stuff. You know, that, that is definitely more that appeal we were going for there like heavy, brutal undertones and stuff like that it makes you feel like you're underwater and stuff like that. And yeah. I had a, an incredibly fun time doing my scene in the rain. Uh, that was like done. That was like a, um, like we, we didn't even plan that actually. We didn't plan that. And we saw this black rain room over on one of the rooms. Cause they had like different type of rooms there at the place we're at. And we just asked the lady, Hey, can we borrow this for like 20 minutes and just see and so that, that ended up being my, my shot in the rain and we just filmed that and it, it looks, it's like one of my favorite things that I have, like a me, like it was like the first thing of me really showcasing my screaming ability, 
like to the mass public uh, in video format because I'm I'm on these other songs where I'm screaming and doing work, but I never really showcased it in like a professional video before. So yeah. that was like an inspiring, cool moment for me that I, I love to watch and uh, again and again, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, and of course I love the the last play song that you did with the drama to break the cycle, and I, it of course features like all four of your vo vocals with like you you and Monty on the leads and sort of Ash and Chase backing up. So tell me about like that collab. Yeah, so the, when I signed with the label, that was one of the songs that my A and R Dave he he sent me. He was like, "Hey, Andromeda was wondering." If you guys would like to be a feature on this track um and it was just uh, the musical stuff you know and um i was like i think this is tight it was kind of had like a mix of new metal and like a future degent vibes to it like doom stuff and i was like yeah let's do this and so i i cranked out the vocals like at three in the morning um writing lyrics just like in my underwear just like right here just like w listening over and over and just writing lyrics to it like how i felt about the song and and uh, everyone seemed to love what I, I had and we went and we 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 took that whole break the cycle kind of theme and went in there and i had this idea when i was writing the bridge here i was like i write right here when i do my lyrics and uh, i was like that'd be cool if we had like a a choir breakdown type of a bridge for this part because the, like the the break of the bridge is so long that there's a lot of space so i was like looking at that and trying to reminisce for like um uh, what could be cool here and like uh cinematic movie stuff like that because I, I love movie scores and things like that so i was trying to implement that in there and uh so i was like how about we have like a everyone do vocals and we we have me on top as like the screaming behind it and it's like a chant you know and bands that i heard that that do that before like wage war does it really well uh if bring the horizons done it a few times so i had that uh influence of that to the idea and going in there so we had i think we got a video of it somewhere but we had everyone go around the microphone and like we're all like not screaming but we're just like yelling the the you know the lyrics to that part and um, I just went in there and laid it right down in the middle of the scream on top of it. And I think that sounds so big and anthemic sounding for the the bridge section. But yeah, that's when everyone came in and did a part. Chase like is a, in a part of the chorus where he's like backing my brother and and it, he sounds yeah. freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah, I need to listen to that closely. I've tried listening closely. It's hard to hear him because I guess him and Monty sound very similar, kind of. Yeah, he. That's the thing we like his voice because it blended it blended well and we, we want we want to make everyone feel like they're a part of this so we, we're trying to like think of ideas and things that uh everyone can add to and so that was something that uh worked out and it was really cool to hear um uh, chase's voice in there layering it and it sounds cool like sounds heavy you know um yeah and then uh i come in with my scream stuff you know kind of lay down what i do and uh, Ash is like doing ripping on harmonies and stuff, you know. So it was, it was really cool. And then we all come together in the the choir sections, and um, that's in the bridge, and then the outro again. Yeah. Of the the whole thing. Yeah. So that yeah. that was really cool, really fun. Yeah. And, and I was uh, like, like so tell telling Chase Chase a few days ago, go since I interviewed him, a cool idea. Like, I, like I was telling him, like, like you should take like sort of like the Kiss or sort of like the Beatles route, where you have have like a song a song where one member <laughs> sort of like takes over lead vocals. Oh uh, yeah, that whole dynamic. De definitely, the foreground is definitely always my brother, uh, for the our signature sound and stuff like that. How we like to ride around, but we definitely like to utilize uh, people and their talents however we can to implement them in. Uh, yeah, because we even had a Johnny, who no one knows about, um, d was doing dubs and stuff like that on Running Out of Time record, and he uh, he definitely had all the 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 uh harmonies down and stuff like that he did a, a tremendous job on it he he polished it really well and stuff like that but a lot of people don't know how, about him but he, he did a great job on it and that's kind of like what we instill like when we work on songs and stuff like that we've we've had a few people even our friend paul um paul bartolome this guy who, who like does music he writes with like asking alexandra he came in and he like did harmonies on the nightmare track um yeah and it sounds freaking tight like he all his backing that's him in the background on the nightmare song on the album um yeah so it, we definitely like you know we're 
we're open to things and stuff like that. We're not closed off, you know. If, if we put like our, we're down to try things, but then we put like our stamp of approval on on it before it goes out, you know, to do yeah. our like beyond a broken thing and what we do, you know, our signature sound, you know. Yeah, of course, with all, all of you having like different different voices, maybe the tonality might make something very unique. It definitely blends well. It It's cool. And we tried it on that song and it worked really well. And I can't, I don't know how much I can talk about our, our what we have down the pipeline right now, but um, it led we, me into we're the next question. Yeah, that we're definitely, uh, we're, we're set up, we're on a schedule right now. We're trying to make like put out fresh new music for everybody. And we're working our ass off, me and my brother mainly. And we we're definitely hitting it every single day and uh uh we're we're trying to make like this thresh line where um we can stay on top of our releases this time and not not slow down and um the next one's already done and stuff like that and it is literally i i it's there's a music video i'll say that um and it's definitely our more most brutal song we ever put out as musicians um it's brutal as hell and we just wanted that's the direction we wanted to go with it and it's 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 crazy i think the music video really ties it well it tells the story really well it's one of those music videos when we did it uh we wanted to keep the anticipation up and just like you want to be at the edge of your seat the whole time and watching what happens next so it gives you that feeling when you watch the music video but um I can't wait for that one to drop. It actually is coming out February 9th. Uh, it's set for right now, uh, February 9th. It comes, I got the, the thing today, like the other day or whatever, but uh, yeah, it's coming out on the 9th. And I don't know if I can talk much more about it or not without my label being like, hey, you're not supposed to promote that yet or something. Yeah, but, uh, yeah is there <laughs> like an out new album in the pipeline yet or is it just like singles? Yeah, so we're, we're doing... Um, doing these uh releases like this it's called a waterfall release and we're doing it up to leading into an album drop so yeah. we're taking like about our label blues about 80 percent of single releases and then dropping the back 20 or 25 percent as an album with ones that people haven't heard of before and stuff like that and then making that the album so it goes across again and kind of gets re-promoted again versus just like dropping an album one time and then just hoping like everyone hears it and then never talking about it again, kind of. So this way, the way the world is kind of nowadays and stuff, like all artists are doing it. Uh, and like uh, definitely the album thing has kind of like died for sure. But we're still doing an album though. You know, we're, we still are. And it, the, all these are leading up to an album. So what we're doing is we're dropping singles so they get the attention that they deserve for each song so everyone can hear what we're you know hear it in its full thing and stuff like that so we get it gets attention and then we we're gonna keep doing the strategy it's called the waterfall yeah and then lead up into the album where we're like okay this is the rest of it and put it all in the album and release it out into the world and do that with it so that that's like the plan for it though yeah and i'm ready to like pre-order already like you deserve my money <laughs> yeah well i'm glad to hear that and you you like our all our stuff that we're doing i think yeah. we're doing a good job and definitely um I, I showed the music video already for the next single to all the staff at our label and i i got huge oh my god responses to it and people going ape shit for it and they're like holy mackerel this is amazing G great job and i was getting a bunch of like holy crap dude like you guys are freaking taking over next year <laughs> and i was like and so i'm super pumped for 2024 with beyond and broken and everything we have coming out for next year we got planned and stuff like that um we're not slowing down we're going we're on octane you know the world's our oyster type of thing you know <laughs> i'm just having fun man i'm definitely having fun and this is fun um i love doing what i do and i couldn't think of anything else i would rather do with my life Right. All right. Are you all like planning on doing any tour soon or is it just like one thing at a time? So what, what are our plans for touring and stuff like that? Uh, we really uh, want to there to be content and we wanted to really work on our social media presence and stuff like that, too, as well. So by doing these and focusing on our social media and our song releases, we've been building up our fan base like we've already since signing the label 
we've doubled our entire fan base in like uh, i don't even know a matter of a few months and stuff like that and so we're building up that side of it first so we can um go out and there be kids there you know <laughs> you know pretty much uh but yeah the anticipation is a really big importance to me uh about how i present our music to the world and stuff like that building up that height and then going out and touring and stuff like that but we're building up to a certain mark and i got a few agencies in mind that i've been talking with and stuff like that uh about the direction of live shows and stuff like that and so the, it's in the pipeline it's work being worked on right now and yeah. um, just having meetings with different agencies yeah yeah i'd hope you all make it to the east coast i'd love to see you play in atlanta like i need to witness you all live oh hell yeah let's go it'd be sweet yeah we want to tour all over the world let's go oh yeah. yeah so uh thank you michael for this conversation it was great to be able to chat with you today it's just any final words you want to say to the viewers start watching this to close this out yeah thank you guys for always listening and repping beyond and broken there's our merch go check out uh the merch at the fixed store slash beyond and broken and stuff like that and thank you for your continued support the band let's keep it going all right 2024 <laughs> awesome so everybody michael money from beyond unbroken see you next time